1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother. So the apostle Paul follows the normal pattern for writing a letter in those ancient times. We write a letter by saying who the letter is to first, and we conclude with writing who the letter is from. In the ancient culture of Paul, a Paul... Um, a letter began with writing who the letter is from and then stating who the letter is to. And so Paul had an extensive history of contact with the city of Corinth, beginning with when he established the church in Corinth, coming there after Athens and staying a year and a half. That happens in Acts chapter 18. And he wrote a letter to the Christians in Corinth from the city of Ephesus in Acts chapter 19, which is mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 9. Uh, this precious letter is lost. And so Paul then received reports, uh, reports from the people in Chloe's household about disturbances in Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 11. And he may have received a delegation from Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 7, who brought him questions from the congregation in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, where it says, Now concerning the things which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Right? And that delegation, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 7, will say, For I do not wish to see you now on the way, but I hope to stay a while with you, if the Lord permits. So then, after all that, Paul wrote 1 Corinthians to respond to these reports. But because of all the time Paul spent in Corinth and all the letters that he wrote them, we know more about the Christians at Corinth than we know about any other church in the New Testament. And so, called to be an apostle, at the outset of the letter, indeed, the very first few words, Paul fearlessly declares his um, ap um, ap apostolic credentials, as is evident from First and Second Corinthians. Paul's standing and authority as an apostle were not appreciated among the Christians in Corinth. And so, called to be an apostle is literally a called apostle. And so, Paul tells them just what kind of apostle he is, a called one. And so Paul knows that he's not one of the twelve, but he's on par with them because like them, he's chosen by God. And so with this, Paul emphasizes his point, right, an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God. Um, and he begins contending with the Christians of Corinth. It is as if he says, you may not recognize my, you know, apostolic credentials. That is little importance to me because I'm not an apostle because of popular election. I'm not an apostle through the appointment of other apostles. I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, not the will of any man. So what is an apostle of Jesus Christ? In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul deals more fully with what makes a person an apostle. However, we learn something just from the meaning of the ancient Greek word apostolos, which has the idea of a special ambassador. Paul was a special ambassador of Jesus Christ to the world and to the church. And so even in his introduction, Paul thinks about the critical issues he needs to communicate to the uh, Corinthian Christians. Paul thought very carefully about this letter. In Sosthenes, this man is perhaps mentioned in Acts chapter 18, verse 17, where it says, Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, a ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. So, as the head of the Corinthian synagogue, and he was beaten because he protected Paul. When Paul first came to Corinth, the ruler of the synagogue was a, na a man named Crispus. Crispus believed on the Lord with all of his household in Acts chapter 18, verse 8. And he was saved. Uh, so he was fired from or quit his job as ruler of the synagogue. And his replacement was a man named Sosthenes, who was beaten by the Roman officials in a bit of uh, anti-Semitic backlash against the Jews who tried to persecute Paul. Perhaps this same Sosthenes in Acts chapter 18, verse 17 is now with Paul. So Paul calls attention to the man with him whom the Corinthian Christians would know, Sosthenes, our brother. So it was common in the ancient world to dictate a letter to the scribe who would write it all down. Probably Sosthenes was Paul's scribe, or more technically, his amanusis. Verse 2, To the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. So most people today associate the word church with a building where Christians meet. But the ancient Greek word for church or ecclesia was a non-religious word for an assembly of people, typically gathered together for a specific purpose. The people are the church, not an organization, not a building. The people are the church. And we need to get back to realizing that. 
So the Greek word has both a Gentile and a Jewish background. In its Gentile sense, it denotes chiefly the citizen assembly of a Greek city. But the Jewish usage that underlies its use uh, to denote the community of believers in Jesus. In the Septuagint, it's one of the words used to denote the people of Israel and their religious character as Yahweh's assembly. So the term Church of God has Old Testament associations, especially in the Septuagint, the ancient Greek translation of the Old Testament. And you can see passages like Numbers 16 verse 3, where it says, They gathered together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, You take too much upon yourselves, for all the congregation is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? Uh, Numbers 20 verse 4, Why have you brought up the assembly of the Lord into the wilderness? Deuteronomy 23 verse 1, He who is emasculated by crushing or mutilation shall not enter the assembly of the Lord. In 1 Chronicles chapter 28, verse 8, Now therefore in the sight of Israel, the assembly of the Lord, and in the hearing of our God. So, because church was a secular term referring to the gatherings of the citizens in a city-state to discuss and decide on matters of public interest, Paul calls the gathering of Christians in Corinth the church of God. It isn't the gathering of the world, but of God. So Paul doesn't only consider believers in Corinth to be the church of God. Believers in Palestine are described that way in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 9 where it says, For I am the least of apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God, uh, as well as the church at large in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verses 31 and 32, which says, Therefore, whatever you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense either to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God. So, Corinth was one of the great cities of the ancient world, and a community very much like Southern California. It was prosperous, busy, growing. It had a deserved reputation for the reckless pursuit of pleasure. Uh, Corinth had a rich ethnic mix, and it was a center for sports, government, military, and business. So when Paul came to Corinth in 50 AD, the city was famous for hundreds of years before he was born. Uh, so ancient writers considered Corinth to be rich, prosperous, always great, and wealthy. The Romans destroyed Corinth in 146 BC, but Julius Caesar, Caesar rebuilt the city a hundred years later. And so many things made Corinth famous. Pottery and Corinthian brass, which is a mixture of gold, silver, and copper from the city were world famous. Famous athletic contests known as the um, Isthmian Games, second only to the Olympian Games, were held at the Temple of Poseidon in Corinth every two years. Athena, Apollo, Poseidon, Hermes, Isis, Serapis... Uh, Asclepius, among others, had temples to their honor in Corinth, but most prominent was the worship of the Corinthian Aphrodite, who had more than 1,000 aerodulae, uh, female prostitutes and priestesses in her service. And so Corinth was a major city of business, especially because of its location. It was on a four and one half mile wide isthmus of land. Um, at its nearest point, that isthmus was crossed by a level track called a dialcus over which vessels were dragged on rollers from one port to the other. This, is, this was in constant use because seamen were thus enabled to avoid sailing around a dangerous uh, promontory of Malaya. So sailors wanted to avoid that dangerous journey around Malaya, which was indicated by two popular proverbs. Let him, let him who sails around Malaya forget his home, and let him, let him who sails around Malaya first make his will. So if the ship was too large to be dragged... Then the cargo was unloaded and loaded onto another ship on the other side of the isthmus. And so the Corinthian people were also known for partying and drunkenness, loose sexual morals. The term uh, Corinthia Zomai was well known in the Roman Empire and it meant literally to live like a Corinthian. But everybody knew what it really meant was to be sexually out of control. Uh, Alain, the late Greek writer, tells us that if ever a Corinthian was shown upon the stage in a Greek play... He was shown to be drunk. So, to the church of God, which is at Corinth. Notice the contrast, the church of God, something good, which is at Corinth, some someplace bad. Understanding the tension between the church and the city is important to understanding the letter of 1 Corinthians. The bottom line is this. Is the church influencing the city, or is the city influencing the church? And Paul is going to continue his description of the Corinthian Christians. The words sanctified and saints communicate the same idea of being set apart from the world to God. You'll notice the words to be are inserted by translators. The Corinthians were called saints, not called to be saints. 
So there is much in 1 Corinthians that is unflattering to the Christians of Corinth. They are shown to have, at times, morality problems, doctrine problems, church government problems, spiritual gift problems, church service problems, as well as authority problems. So it might be easy for us to think that they weren't even saved, but they were. They were called saints. We might also think saying called saints is mere flattery, Paul's way of preparing them for coming rebuke. Well, it's not. The Corinthian Christians are called saints, but this was not based on the outward performance of the Corinthians. It was founded on a promise of God when he said, For I have many people in the city in Acts chapter 18 verse 10. So, in his first few words, Paul lays the foundation for a fundamental issue he's going to address in this letter. Christian unity, based on the common lordship of Jesus Christ. The Corinthian Christians are called saints, but that's not exclusive to them. They are saints together with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Jesus is both their Lord and our Lord. And because they share a common Lord, they share an essential unity. Verse 3, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So the greeting includes grace and peace, which is very typical of Paul's letters. It draws from both the Greek and Jewish customs. Paul uses the exact phrase five times, uh, five other places in the New Testament. So grace is always first, peace is always second. And this is due to the fact that grace is the source of peace. And so Paul will often, more than 17 times in the letter, he's going to refer to Jesus as the Lord Jesus Christ. It is well to recall what this title means. Lord is a title designating not only master and boss, but also the Lord revealed in the Old Testament, known as Yahweh or Jehovah. This term could be no more than just a polite form of address like our sir, but it could also be used of the deity that one worships. The really significant background, though, is its use in the Greek translation of the Old Testament to render the divine name Yahweh. So Christians who use this as their Bible would be familiar with the term as equivalent to deity. So Jesus was the given name of the son of Mary and adopted son of Joseph, which is the Greek pronunciation of Joshua. The name Joshua means Yahweh is salvation. And Christ is the ancient Greek translation of the Hebrew word for Messiah or anointed one. This one, uh, this is the one that was prophesied by the Old Testament scriptures, sent by the Father to save and deliver us. Verses 4 through 9. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in everything by him and all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come short in that in no gift eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. So Paul will later spend most of his letter rebuking sin and correcting error, yet he's still sincerely thankful for God's work in the Corinthian Christians. So those who feel called to rebuke sin and correct error in the church today should follow Paul's example. Unfortunately, many of them never communicate any encouragement with their correction and advice. And so this was the specific reason for Paul's gratitude. Everything good the, Christian, uh, the Corinthian Christians have from God has come to them by grace. Grace means that God gives freely for his own reasons. And so enriched in everything by him and all utterance and knowledge, this was the effect of grace in the life of the Corinthian Christians. The Corinthians were a rich church, not just materially, but also in their speech and knowledge of Jesus, in their abounding in the gifts, and that they lived in anticipation to Jesus' coming. And so the work of God in the Corinthian Christians could be seen by what they said, by what they learned, and the supernatural element in their lives, and by their expectant uh, anticipation of Jesus' return. And so when Paul looked at the Corinthian church, he could say, these people proclaim Jesus, they know about Jesus, and there are the supernatural gifts of God among them, and they're excited about his return. So whatever problems they had, they had some pretty impressive strong points. Can this even be said about many churches today? We may pride ourselves on not having the problems of the Corinthian Christians, but do we have their positives? Yet these positives were no great credit to the Corinthian Christians themselves. They were not the spiritual achievement of the Corinthians, but the work of the grace of God in them. And so Paul thanks God for the gifts among the, Christi uh, the Corinthians. 
even though they were causing some trouble. He recognizes that the gifts were not the problem, but the wrong attitudes and beliefs about the gifts were the problem. And so the Corinthian Christians were indeed gifted, yet they were carnal. And so the Corinthian Christians had their strong points, but they also had their weak points. And Paul praises God for the positives and expresses confidence that God will take care of the weak points and confirm them to the end, that they would be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. So how can Paul be confident of this when the Corinthian church had so many problems? He can be confident because God is faithful. He is the one who has called them into the fellowship of his son. So he is the one who will confirm them to the end and present them blameless. And so in the first 10 verses, Paul refers to Jesus in every verse for a total of 11 times. In this emphasis on Jesus, Paul promotes the sure cure for the problems of the Corinthians, getting your eyes off yourself and onto Jesus. Verse 10, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you speak, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. So Paul was an apostle of Jesus Christ. He had authority in the church, and he had a right and the authority to command the Corinthian Christians in these matters. Instead, with a loving heart, he begs them, he pleads with them to be unified as believers. And so the ancient Greek word for divisions is schismata. And although we derive our English word schism from this Greek word, it doesn't really mean a party or a faction. It properly means to tear or rend. And so Paul's plea is that they stop ripping each other apart, tearing up the body of Christ. And so the contrast to divisions is to be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Instead of being torn apart, Paul pleads that they would be joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Verse 11 through 13. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, that each one of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? So Chloe was a woman, probably a Christian, whose business interests caused her representatives those of her household, to travel between Ephesus and Corinth. Paul writes this letter from Ephesus where these people from Chloe's household visited and told him about the condition of the Corinthian church. And so the Corinthian church suffered under quarreling and conflict. This conflict had made them divide up into parties or cliques, each party having its own leader. And so there was a Paul party who declared, we're following in the footsteps of the man who founded our church, the Apostle Paul. We're the ones that are really right with God. Uh, there was an Apollos party who declared we're following in the footsteps of a man who is in great power and spiritual gifts, and an impressive man. We're the ones right with God. In Acts chapter 18, verses 24 and 25, he says, Now a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. And this man had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit. He spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only of the baptism of John. All right. And then there was the Peter party, I am of Cephas, who declared, we're following in the footsteps of who is the first among all the apostles. And Jesus gave him the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and he's our man. We're right with God. And then there was the Jesus party who declared, you're also carnal, following after mere men. We're following in the footsteps of no one less than Jesus himself. And so it's possible there was not an actual Paul, Apollos, Peter, or Jesus party at Corinth. Uh, later in this letter, Paul writes that he transferred to himself and Apollos would apply to others in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. He says, Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes, that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one against the other. So the actual Corinthian factions may have centered around people in the congregation, um, but if this is the case, the picture fits. Paul may be changing the names to protect the innocent or to show mercy to the guilty. And so the Corinthians boasting about their party leaders was really boasting about themselves. It wasn't so much that they thought Apollos was great, but that they were great for following him. And so though division is ungodly, it's not wrong to make distinctions between churches and ministers. God has made different churches and different ministries with different callings and characters because the job of preaching the gospel is too big for any one group. And so Jesus does not belong to any one party. These cliques ignore the truth of unity over all the diversity in the church, even if they're all in the name of spirituality. 
So spiritual elitism is terrible, no matter whose name it's practiced in. And so even more foolish than dividing Jesus is to center parties in the church around men. When Paul explained it like this, it shows how foolish it is to focus on anybody but Jesus. Verses 14 through 17. I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that I had baptized in my own name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Besides, I do not know whether I baptize any other. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. So apparently some of the Corinthian Christians, probably those of the Paul party here, made a big deal of the fact that they had been baptized by Paul. Because it was becoming a a divisive issue, Paul was therefore grateful that he had not baptized very many people in Corinth. And of course, Paul did baptize a few. Crispus is likely mentioned in Acts chapter 18, verse 8, and Gaius is in Romans 16, verse 23. So for Paul, preaching was more important than baptizing. Though he was not certainly opposed to baptism, yet we can see this that baptism is not essential to salvation. If it were, if the teaching of baptismal regeneration were true, then Paul can never thank God that he baptized so few in Corinth. And he, as an evangelist, could never say that Christ did not send me to baptize. That Paul did not regard baptism as essential to salvation is also seen by the fact that he did not keep careful track of those that he baptized. Right. Besides, I don't know whether I baptized any other. So surely Paul remembered uh, his converts, but the issue of baptism, though it's important, was not as important to Paul. So... In light of I thank God that I baptized none of you, it's impossible to claim that Paul was a sacramentalist. He clearly denies here that he considers baptism essential to the remission of sin or the means of obtaining forgiveness. That's done through faith. It's a spiritual baptism. And so this passage also makes it clear that the individual doing the baptizing doesn't really affect the validity of the baptism. Those baptized by the great apostle Paul had zero advantage over those baptized by some unknown believer. The power of baptism is the spiritual reality it presents, not in who performs it. And so, how did Paul preach in Corinth? Not with the wisdom of words, which can be translated cleverness of speaking. Paul came speaking very plainly, without any attempt to dazzle with eloquence or intellect. And Paul came to Corinth from Athens, where he contended with the great philosophers of the day in terms that they could understand. You'll remember that from Acts 17, verses 16 through 34. Some people will think that Paul was disappointed by the results in Athens and resolved to preach differently in Corinth. And there is a significant difference between Paul's ministry in Athens and his work in Corinth. Paul was in Athens a day or two, but he stayed in Corinth for a year and a half. And Paul makes it clear that it is possible to preach the gospel in a way that makes it of no effect. If one preaches the word with a reliance on wisdom of words, they can make the gospel of no effect. Just let scripture tell its own story. So how sobering this is. The great gospel of Jesus Christ, the very power of God unto salvation, made empty and of no effect through the pride and cleverness of men. This danger was constantly on the mind of the Apostle Paul and should be constantly on the mind of any preacher or teacher. Right? The concerts, the hooping and hollering, and the dramatic voices... They get a lot of attention and they really stir you up. But using slick words like that can really make the gospel of no effect. Let the scripture tell its own story. Verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So in uh, verse 17, Paul declares the idea that the cross could be made of no effect if it was presented with the wisdom of words. Paul will now show why this is true of the cross and the message of the gospel. So to those who reject the salvation of the cross, the idea of being saved through the work of a crucified man is totally foolish. The words message of the cross sound kind of noble and religious to our 20th century ears, but in the first century, saying message of the cross was about the same as saying message of the electric chair, except way worse. Uh, What message does a cruel, humiliating, unrelenting instrument of death have? And so no wonder it's the, you know, it's foolishness to those who are perishing. So though it's a strange message and regarded as foolish by those perishing, to those who trust in it and are being saved, this message of the cross becomes to them the actual power of God. So there is inherent power in the preaching of the true gospel when it's received with faith. The hearing and trusting of the true gospel will bring the power of God into your life. 
And though the word gospel isn't in this verse, it is in the previous verse. For Paul, the message of the cross was the gospel. It was impossible for the apostle to preach the gospel without presenting the message of the cross. So, preaching a high moral standard is not preaching the gospel. Preaching a universal fatherhood of God is not preaching the gospel. Preaching the universal brotherhood of man is not preaching the gospel. The gospel is the message of the cross, period. And so the verb tenses of our perishing and our being saved are significant. They both describe a work in progress. So each of us is definitely moving in one of those two directions. Verse 19 through 21. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. So in this quotation from Isaiah 29 verse 14, Paul shows that in spiritual matters, God opposes the wisdom of man. He will destroy the wisdom of the wise, not bow down before it. And so in light of what God says in Isaiah 29 verse 14, now where is your wise man, where is your scribe, the disputer of this age? God made them all foolish through his wisdom. He destroyed the wisdom of the wise just like he said he would. And so there's constant tendency to think that the smartest and wisest humans will know the most about God. But God cannot be found through human wisdom, only through the message of the cross. The pursuit of human wisdom may bring an earthly contentment or happiness, though this is rare, but in itself it can never bring the true knowledge of the true God. And so it's significant that often the most educated people have the least regard for God. And this is not always the case. Some of the most brilliant men of history have been Christians, like Isaac Newton. Uh, but largely, the smarter one will see himself, uh, the less regard he has for God. Right? The smarter one will see themselves, the less they will think about God. Human wisdom is constantly rejecting God and opposing him, and ultimately showing itself foolish and perishing in doing so. So the Corinthians wanted to believe that the gospel itself was a sublime form of wisdom, as the Greeks considered wisdom, Sophia. Uh, Paul replies, how foolish can you get? What is there wise in the Greek sense of wisdom about a crucified Messiah? So the phrases foolishness of the message and foolishness of God do not mean that Paul actually considered the message and God foolish. He's describing them as they appear to the perishing unsaved man, the wise man of this age. They will deem that message as foolish. And God's wisdom is not man's wisdom multiplied to the highest degree. It's wisdom of a different order altogether. Isaiah 55 verses 8 9 will say, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So Paul isn't condemning all learning or education. He merely says that by themselves, they are useless for obtaining spiritual wisdom. And so God takes pleasure in accomplishing our salvation in a way that no one would have expected. He's happy to do it in this way, which offends the height of human wisdom. Verse 22 through 25. For Jews request a sign and Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So in Paul's day, the Jewish word was, uh, the world, was looking for a sign. Specifically, they wanted the sign of a miraculous uh, messianic deliverance to deal with the Roman problem. <laughs> They were not looking for the message of the cross. Their desire was deliverance was not bad, but their rejection of God's way of deliverance was bad. And so their idolatry was that they had, um, they now had God completely figured out. He would simply repeat the exodus, uh, but just greater. And so the Greek culture valued the pursuit of wisdom, usually expressed in high academic philosophical terms. They didn't uh, value the wisdom expressed in the message of the cross. Their desire for wisdom was not bad, but their rejection of God's wisdom was bad. So instead of giving the Jews and Greeks what they demanded in deliverance of wisdom, God gave them something unexpected, a crucified Messiah. So Christ, Messiah, meant power, splendor, and triumph. Crucified meant weak, defeat, and humiliation. So Christ crucified was the, you know, it's the ultimate oxymoron. And this is what Paul preached. 
So if the cross doesn't seem strange to you, then you either don't understand how the cross was seen in Jesus' day, or you just don't understand who Jesus is. You don't understand the tension between Christ and crucified. And so the Jews regarded Christ crucified as a stumbling block. Perhaps it's better understood as an offense or a scandal. The Greeks considered Christ crucified as foolishness, but God did not respond to the polling data. He kept his gospel. Because for those who believed it, both Jews and Greeks, Christ crucified is the power of God and the wisdom of God. And so if the cross and its message seem weak, they are not. They are powerful and wise. But our expectations of what God should do to keep us from receiving that power and wisdom. Right? A lot of people demand God to do anything other than what he has clearly outlined. And so Paul knew this by experience. He was once scandalized by a crucified Christ. It infuriated him that... Uh, one obviously cursed by God, according to Deuteronomy 21, verse 23, where it says, you know, for he who is hanged on a, on a tree is accursed, that, the, that that person should be honored as a Messiah and Lord. So he persecuted the church before being confronted by Jesus on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9. And as much as Paul was once offended by a crucified Messiah, so the Greeks thought the message of salvation through a humiliating instrument of death very foolish. There's a well-known piece of graffiti in Rome that shows a worshiper standing next to a crucified figure with the body of a man and the head of an ass, and it says, Alex Eminos worships his God. This is how foolish the Greeks saw the cross. So those who insist that we must change the emphasis of the gospel because people can't relate to it today must realize that the people of Paul's day couldn't relate to this preaching either, yet he kept it up and with great results because of it. And so God was at his most foolish and very weakest at the cross, but it's infinitely wiser and stronger than anything a man could do. So salvation is not the achievement of human wisdom. It's the embrace of God's dramatic, unexpected act of love at Calvary. Verse 26 through 29, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things that which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. But the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence. So Paul says to the Corinthians, look at yourselves, you're no great bargain. There were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble among the Christians at Corinth. And so looking again at the Corinthians, Paul can say, you are not wise according to the world. You're not mighty or noble. You are among the foolish things of the world. And so no doubt many of the Corinthian Christians were beginning to think of themselves in high terms because of God's work in them. Paul will not allow this. They have been chosen because they are so great, but because, um, you know, they haven't been chosen because they are great, but because God is so great. And so put to shame the wise is going to explain part of the pleasure of God that's described in verse 21. God loves to rebuke the idolatry of human wisdom, and he often does it by choosing and using the foolish things of the world. God isn't saying that it's better to be foolish or uneducated. He's saying that the world's wisdom and education does not bring us salvation in Jesus Christ. Right? All those theories and hypotheses and everything like that that the schools are embracing, all that worldly knowledge really steers us away, uh, and none of it being proven. And so God has called the weak and ignorant first, but not exclusively. Shepherds first, then wise men, fishermen first, then the educated, like Paul, who was himself an educated man. So the ancient Christians were, for the most part, slaves and men of, no, of low station. The whole history of the expansion of the church is, in reality, a progressive victory of the ignorant over the learned, the lowly over the lofty, until the emperor himself laid down his crown before the cross of Christ. And so this is the end result that no flesh should glory in his presence. No one will stand before God and declare, I figured you out, or you did it just like I thought you should. God's ways are greater and higher, and nothing of the flesh will glory in his presence. Verse 30 and 31. But of him you are in Jesus Christ, who came for us wisdom from God, and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that, as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. So Jesus perfectly shows us in his teaching and life, God's wisdom. Uh, this wisdom is often in contradiction to man's expectation. True wisdom isn't about getting smart. God's wisdom is received in and through the person of Jesus. 
And Jesus is not only wisdom for us, he's righteousness and sanctification and redemption. In his work, you know, Jesus Christ, he communicates three things to those who are in Christ Jesus. Righteousness means that we're legally declared not only not guilty, but we have a positive righteousness. It means that the righteous deeds and character of Jesus are accounted to us. We don't become righteous by focusing on ourselves because Jesus became for us righteousness. Sanctification speaks of our behavior and how believers are to be separate from the world and unto God. We don't grow in sanctification by focusing on ourselves, but on Jesus, because Jesus became for us sanctification. Redemption is a word from the slave trade. The idea is that we've been purchased to a permanent freedom. We don't find freedom by focusing on ourselves, because Jesus became for us redemption. Right, very black and white there. So Paul uses the reference, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. That's a reference to Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 and 24, to show that God did did it all this way so that God would get the glory. The path for God's glory is Christ crucified. The evidence of God's glory is his choice of the lowly, 